Tickets. Tickets, please. Step inside, take a ride, upon the terror train. All aboard, be fair warned, these rails house fear and pain. Find a seat, don't mind the heat, just pray the lights stay on. Upon these rails, these bloody rails, in darkness lies no dawn. Yes, step inside, come crawl or glide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Take it, please. <laughs> James Ward Kirk Publications presents Terror Train Episode 112 Tennessee and Missouri. Welcome aboard. Welcome to my home. I am the disembodied voice, your ghost host, so to speak. Call me Terror. <laughs> Welcome to my train. Be you dead, undead, or of the living? Tonight, born from Tennessee, is Arthur Dale. And in screen what is bliss, a spectral rail, and a haunting river, whose spectres upon the rails, <laughs> delightfully frightening, yes? <laughs> Good. <laughs> we have you right where we want you. <laughs> the conductor is handed a bloody ticket which reads dead. Take it, please. Bells over Red River by Dale Holland. You shouldn't sit near the glass, sir. The man fell into the seat, 
glancing quickly over to the young woman's voice across from him. She was even more beautiful than he had thought when first entering the carriage. He lifted his hat from atop his head and dropped it onto his lap, casually. His eyes lowered to the powder blue ruffles of her dress and the white gloved hands she gripped her knees with. She was barefoot. Her toes appeared gray and thinly caked with dried mud, as if she had been walking in the rain before boarding the vessel. I'm so sorry, miss. Is the seat taken? You caught me a bit off guard, see? I was late in stopping myself from sitting down. She moved her head slowly from the window to face him. He was smiling. A pleasant smile. One she would enjoy. At least for a time. She sighed deeply and returned her eyes beyond the glass. She heard the steam from the engine release and the train lurched slightly forward. They never listened. Before the long wail of the train's whistle, they never heard her voice. The seat is taken by you. She's already seen. It's yours now. He glanced towards the door. The attendant was pushing a beverage cart through the corridor. His aged and dark form seemed to cast two shadows upon the wall. One was still, while the other gestured wildly with his movements. The traveler watched the silhouettes and grinned. A distant memory tickled the back of his mind like dark feathers brushing against a mortal wound. He forced his attention back to the attendant. We have scotch and bourbon, sir, and ice, if you wish. The passenger motioned to the woman to get her attention. Uh, would you like a drink also, miss? She turned toward him, her face slack. The corners of her lips raised slightly, and she slowly shook her head before returning her gaze to the passing scenery. The trees seemed to be moving closer to the track in a narrowing, blurry gauntlet. The man looked up at the attendant, who was staring at the seat towards the woman. Yes, my good man, I'll have a bourbon, with ice, if you would. The attendant turned towards the man, looking at him for a few moments, expressionless. The engine whistle howled, and both men lurched forward, startled. He shook his head, began putting ice in the glass, and lifted the bottle. Yes, sir, coming right up, sir. He handed the man the glass and glanced back at the woman. You need anything else, sir? You just ring, you hear? He watched the attendant push the cart from view and turned back to his blonde companion. My name is Jonas, Jonas Rotherwood. I'm heading to California. And you, Miss... She lowered her face and smiled. My name is Betsy, Mr. Rotherwood. California is a long way off, maybe too far for a man like you. I'll be leaving before the train crosses into Missouri. A bit before that, Mr. Rotherwood. He glanced to her feet and watched her curl her toes. Tiny pieces of dried mud flaked off and fell to the floor of the compartment. He felt his heart quicken and glanced up to her face again. She was watching the trees. They were thinning out and seemed more distant. I remember you, it seems. You seem somehow different from our meeting in Kingsport, though. Do you have a traveling companion with you? You mentioned another lady earlier. Has she taken another seat on my account? Betsy smiled, but continued to stare through the glass. Yes. He remembered her. Men such as him were always remembering what made them feel more in control, even while being harnessed and pulled through the wilderness under no power of their own. No. She seats herself with us sometimes, but sometimes she just follows. She's outside now, in the churchyard. Do you remember her also, Mr. Rotherwood? She lifted her hand and pressed her index finger against the window. Jonas turned towards the glass, 
as the train passed into a clearing. The train whistle blew again loudly as the tracks ran beside what appeared to be an abandoned church. The structure partially burned in the past, the windows and steeple covered with soot and charred by flame. Beside the church was a small cemetery with a dozen or so gravestones jutting up from the earth like broken teeth. A woman with dark hair stood before the barrel. Her long white gown hung slack on her pale frame, and her dark eyes stared at him, following the carriage, until he turned away from her. How is she with you? The train hasn't stopped. She should remain in the churchyard and know her place. She looked away from the window, pursing her lips and staring at the floor. You haven't finished your whiskey yet. I've always loved the scent of bourbon on a man. She knows your heart as I know it. You should really look again. He inhaled deeply through his nose and looked away from her and beyond the glass. The trees were becoming dense again. He lifted the glass and drained it. The glistening of the ice caught his attention in the reflection of the window. He saw her move in the glass, the dark-haired woman sitting beside the one called Betsy. She was staring at him. He turned his head quickly to the seat across from him. Betsy was alone and smiling at him. Are you okay, sir? Is there nothing in the trees? He turned slowly away from the sweet and innocent curve of her lips and once again stared into the more orphic grin within the reflection. Both women turned away from him in the glass and looked at each other, the dark-haired one sliding her hand beneath the white ruffles at the top of Betsy's dress and pulling the younger woman towards herself harshly. The blonde one let her head loud back against the seat, smiling and running her tongue across her upper lip. You're not there, he whispered. He felt a light touch on his neck, like a breath, and felt himself start violently, glancing around the compartment. Who's not there? You mean Mistress Kate? Oh, she's here, sir. Sometimes she is. But she won't be with us long, not past the river. She never travels past the river. Mostly I don't either. Unless, of course... The right man asked for my hand and wed me. Then we could be rid of her forever. Would you do that, Mr. Rotherwood? Help me pass the river, I mean. His lips felt dry, and he looked at her. She was alone again. He needed another drink. She lowered her eyes and smiled at his shoes. She wanted to see his feet. He covered the damp and gray soil with his shoes. It seemed he didn't want it to dry. Would you like me to ring for the attendant, Mr. Rotherwood? I'm getting rather thirsty. Maybe some wine or champagne? He looked towards the corridor, hearing what seemed to be a faint giggle. A woman's laugh. She raised her eyes to him and sighed deeply. The witch would take this one from her, like all the others. She was hungry. The attendant and his cart began to pass again in front of the doorway of the compartment. Jonas's face became slack, and the train whistle blew loudly again. He lurched forward, and his lips broke open into a slow grin. You need anything else, sir? Another bourbon, maybe? Jonas glanced over to the woman. She wouldn't take her eyes off his feet. No, no bourbon this time. We were wondering if you had a bottle of decent champagne aboard. The lady would like a glass. The attendant glanced over to where the man was looking, and then quickly back. Yes, sir. We always keep a few bottles of that round, mainly for the honeymoon travelers. We ain't got no buckets, though. But it cold. That be okay? Jonas smiled and nodded to the man. The once still shadow cast from the attendant's arrival began removing itself into the corridor. 
the wench would hide herself. Her kind always did, eventually. He motioned with his hand to the servant. Yes, yes, my good man, that would be fine. The attendant nodded and reached within the cart's icebox compartment. He lifted the bottle and then a crystal stem from the top and walked towards the man, stretching his arms out to hand him the vessels. Jonas took them. We'll need two glasses, if you would. We're sharing a toast. Betsy lifted her eyes, smiling. She watched the man glance again towards where she was sitting, and then nervously back to Jonas. Yes, sir. Two glasses. I's get that right away. The attendant handed him the second stem and hurried back to the corridor, leaving them alone again. Jonas stared at the empty doorway for a moment. The still shadow didn't appear to follow the attendant this time. He lifted the bottle and grinned at the blonde one. He seems an odd chap, nervous about something. Yes, she whispered. Twilight is approaching. He's like that sometimes. He looked at her, as if not comprehending her words, and then turned his attention to removing the cork from the bottle. The train had been inclining through a heavily forested hill, and he felt himself becoming dizzy. The sound of the champagne opening made him flinch, and the whistle howled its silent song into the darkening and skeletal scenery. All would be well. He glanced to the window, looking for the dark-haired one. She was nowhere. He smiled and poured the golden draught into the stems. Betsy lowered her eyes and grinned as she took the offering and drank of it. Once we reach the top, Mr. Rotherwood, we will be passing down into the Red River Valley. It will be fully dark by then. Will you ask me for my hand before we're past the undertow? Or will I be leaving you alone? Jonas sipped his wine and glanced into the corridor again, squinting his eyes. Her shadow was there. The mistress. He had known the woman before. Known of her. Something of her scent. He inhaled deeply, watching Betsy's face go slack and turn to the doorway. Now, or ever after, he wanted her. He imagined his fingers jerking the top of her dress down and pulling her to him, much like the mistress had done in the reflection. She would be his. It seems we may have someone to take care of first, Miss Betsy. It appears as if you're spoken for. She turned her head slowly towards Jonas, her face still a blank, pallid mask. She glanced quickly at the seat beside him, and then back to his eyes. He was smiling. All men refused to see her. Even when they bled, they refused to see. Maybe it's not me that's spoken for, Mr. Rotherwood. Maybe not me at all. The whistle roared into the approaching dawn, and he looked again at the reflection within the window. The dark-haired one was sitting next to him and grinning. Her hand began moving up his leg and she lowered her head towards his chest, her mouth slowly opening as it descended closer to his lap. He jolted upright, nearly stumbling across the compartment. His seat was empty. The trees outside the window became a blur as the coach began declining rapidly into the valley. He glanced into the reflection again. The mistress was standing in the doorway, her mouth still wide open and staring at him. She seemed hungry. He lowered his eyes to the floor of the compartment and grasped the blonde woman's hand. She didn't hide in the glass. She was smiling at him. She is no one, he whispered. There's no one here. Not even us. The blonde woman laughed. You can feel me, Mr. Rotherwood. You can take me away from this. I'm yours, if you take me." Jonas lifted his head and stared into her eyes. Her pupils were large, gaping pools of blackness. 
and he saw the dark-haired woman reflected within each of them, staring back at him, her mouth still hanging open, and seemed to move towards him within the orbs. He raised his hand and jerked Betsy's body against his own, tearing the top of her dress and pressing his lips to hers. He heard the siren wail again and felt her lips go cold. He pulled her body closer, as if to meld her flesh into his own. She would warm with him. Her body seemed to go limp, as if in complete surrender to his own. He moved his face back from hers and eased his hold on her form, smiling. She was his. If he knew nothing else, he knew this. Your Mistress Kate won't have you now, my love. I've taken you. Jonas felt the soft laugh caress his ears from the corridor behind him. He opened his eyes. The blonde woman's head had lolled back across the top of the bench. Her mouth had fallen open, and her eyes were glazed over and staring at the ceiling of the compartment. He lifted his face to match the same angle her neck was leaning. No, you're not gone. You're still here. You're still mine. He glanced quickly to the window. The pale light of dawn blighted any reflection the glass once held. The soft laughter tinkled like crystalline <laughs> bells from behind them again. He swiveled his head around to the doorway. It was empty. The train whistle sounded loudly in his ears, and the tinkling laughter of the bells became deafening. He shook the woman lightly, watching her head roll forward against his shoulder and then back again, craning her neck and staring with unseeing eyes. You don't see me here. You're here. You're not gone. We have to leave now. You'll be here again if we leave. I'll find the attendant. Tell him he must stop the train. We'll leave. He lifted her in his arms, cradling her still form and stumbling through the doorway of the compartment into the corridor. He glanced quickly down the hall for the mistress. She was nowhere. He began laughing. She's running from us. We're leaving and she has nowhere to go. She has no one. He stepped forward down the moving hall. He needed the attendant. The breath felt cold across his tongue. He stopped outside the doorway of the next compartment. Someone would tell him where to find the man. He stared into the room and dropped his eyes to the people seated within. He watched as a man shook what appeared to be a blonde-haired woman, her head nodding forward and then falling back across the top of the bench. It was himself. He stared as the woman he was shaking stared blankly at the ceiling, her mouth gaping open. He glanced quickly across the compartment and saw the dark-haired woman staring up at him in the doorway, smiling. You see now, don't you? You can't leave. Jonas felt his breath quicken and become colder. He stumbled from the doorway towards the back of the car, nearly dropping his prize as he ran. No, you're no one. We're leaving. He reached the exit door of the coach and stopped, looking out the window. The siren howled and the train moved rapidly into a clearing. He laughed. They were moving onto a wooden trestle, elevated high above a dark river. He struggled while holding her to open the door of the car. My bride. Yes, my bride. We're leaving her. The damp morning air felt alive against his skin, as if it were feeding off the moisture of his lips and tongue. He looked down and saw the river approaching. The forest along its banks appeared dark orange in splotches, where the dawn peaked its burning gaze through the foliage. He smiled and stepped forward, dropping through the wind like a large bird, dying and falling from the sky. Her breath felt warm as he looked into her eyes. She was smiling. His bride was smiling, and he laughed aloud as he plunged into the blackness. He grasped at her face to kiss her again, and the blackness filled his mouth. He sought to tell her she was his, and the blackness filled his mouth. He said, 
I do. And the blackness filled him. The blonde woman pulled herself from the current and onto the bank of the river. She tore at what was left of the wet gown, letting it fall around her ankles, and turned towards the current. His body floated to the surface, face down in the water. She wrapped her arms around herself, caressing the warm flesh of her shoulders. Are you sated now, mistress? Is this all you wish? A soft laugh, like crystalline bells, drifted gently from behind her. The ritual hymns of the cicadas filled the trees, and she watched as his body began drifting with the current slowly downstream. No. Betsy turned slowly and watched the dark-haired one move forward, her arms outstretched to embrace her. I haven't yet kissed the bride. River Run Katie Trail, Missouri by David S. Pointer Occupied zones inside steam motive boxcars didn't exist, but the chief engineer had seen an aluminum arm scissor out of an open crack, grabbing a woman passenger by her lab coat collar, as if it were a casket handle, pulling her back through smoke puff, while others started to reboard. All eye caps again refastened to guard against submersible dream identification.
Yes. Our guests have taken their permanent seats. From New York to time and infinity. Are you ready to join them? Hmm. Perhaps another story will lure you. Choose a car, any car, for the time we had a permanent guest as they tell their tales of horror at its best. Come, yeah, join. Survived this trek? No turning back. Dare resist, just try. Step back inside, we'll be your guide. So many ways to die. Upon this ride, nowhere to hide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Terror Train Podcast, Episode 112, Tennessee and Missouri. Produced by Krista Clark Grabowski, David Schutz II, and Mary Genevieve Fortier. Podcast directed and arranged by David Schutz II. The conductor, or narrator, was created by and played by David Schutz II. Terror, the disembodied voice, was created by and played by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Terror Train Podcast Opening and Closing Poems Written by Mary Genevieve Fortier Host Segment Dialogue for Terror, The Disembodied Voice Written by Mary Genevieve Fortier Production Music The House of Leaves Chase Pulse The Hive and The Voices by Kevin MacLeod Incompetech.com Featured Works Bells Over Red River Written by Dale Holland Production Music Night of Chaos Satiate Strings Unseen Horrors Unnatural Situation Nightbreak and Penumbra by Kevin MacLeod Incompetech.com River Run Katie Trail, Missouri Written by David S. Pointer Production Music Grave Blow by Kevin MacLeod in Competech.com Additional sound effects by AudioSoundClips.com Podcast program edited by David Schutz II The stories and poems presented in the Terror Train podcasts are all featured in the James Ward Kirk publishing anthology Terror Train which was edited by Krista Clark Grabowski and A. Henry Keen Cover art by Stephen Cooney Content Copyright 2014 Terror Train Podcast Episode 112 Tennessee and Missouri Copyright 2014